Welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. I have Denis De Bernardi here. Uh, Denis, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, right. So I'm. Um, uh, it's a long story, but I'm basically I'm I'm an engineer uh, by train uh, background uh, with a, a dual degree in management, and I uh, spent the better part of my career uh, doing what engineers and managers do, and with a distant eye. Uh, uh, on the environment, following the media and so forth. And uh, when I when COVID started, uh, really, I I decided that okay, enough of this, and uh, let's let's get into environmental issues. Basically, and I uh, I had concerns at the time because I had been following the two thousand eight meltdown financial crisis from pretty closely. And so I was expecting the, um, uh, a complete meltdown of the financial system uh, when it started. And I had no idea when, uh, but I basically certain that it was looming. And, and so I figured, well, might as well get into farming because that way at least you have something to eat. And, uh, and plus there were still these environmental concerns in my, in my mind. And so I, uh, uh, got into farming at the time, and uh, as I did, I was learning about uh, like uh, digging deeper into environmental issues and uh, learning all sorts of things about the um, uh, what, what the environmental movement was actually up to in the background, uh, which had never really concerned me as an engineer, end user of the the stuff. Uh, but uh, now that I was uh, looking deeper into the topic. It felt a bit weird, and eventually I decided to uh, to get involved with it, and uh, so that's how we end up in this conversation. I think one the one of the movies that triggered me most was. Uh, um, do you remember that Michael Moore movie, Planet of the Humans? Do you, I do. The campaign against it had shocked me at the time. You you remember like the negative campaign, and. Yeah, I do, and, yeah. and that's when I that's when I started to look deeper. That that's really like it was the it was a complete trigger for me. I I I picked up on the negative press. I did not agree with it. I the the movie had struck me as balanced overall, uh, and and to, you know putting good arguments forward like this is not right. Like all of this mining is completely absurd, right? Uh, all of this uh, industrialized process is completely absurd as well. Uh, the, the, like m m mining for 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 those in the audience who are uh, are not too familiar, like it creates phenomenal amounts of uh, mining waste because you know like you dig deep and you dig compressed rock, so the volume of waste that comes out uh, is actually more because you need to pulverize it, and so that decompresses all of the rocks and so forth. So like it's a humongous amount. Uh, uh, of mining waste, which is uh, at times toxic. Uh, it's it's really really not uh, uh, nice to live near a mine uh, or work in one for that matter. And, and the the science that's also the time when I started picking up on the, the science because the um, uh, they 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 were arguing like the science says the science says the science says, but then when you start reading. Uh, the actual uh, signature of uh, like carbon signature of, of green tech, you begin to realize that there's a whole bunch of things that are completely missing, uh, such as uh, like the health ramifications for the nearby population. It's not accounted for ever. Uh, like all of the side effects, the context of uh, uh, of mining really uh, is completely absent, and of the waste, the, the waste streams, the, the 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 carbon signature stops at the landfill. Essentially, and uh, what happens after is we don't know. Plus, all of the logistics problems, like it, 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 it it's just such a pointless uh, thing. And so uh, that prompted me to to get into um, uh, to look deeper into resilience. And uh, at the time, I was already into permaculture, uh, so it uh, it was a bit second nature to to dive deeper uh, and and continue learning how to grow food and. Um, that led me to uh, stumble upon uh, uh, green colonialism. Now, green colonialism is um, uh, not well known in the West, but it's actually a thing. 
um, your do, have you ever had a, a guest on this uh, that, that discusses uh, this topic? No, I don't think so. Okay, so um, uh, there are conservancies uh, like the WWF or the Nature Conservancies. Uh, they are in charge of uh, saving nature, right? And the way they save nature is they go to places like Africa or South uh, South Asia or uh, Latin America. Uh, and they say, oh, this is a very lovely area and we need to save it. We need to protect it. Now, sometimes they work a bit with the locals and they get the locals involved and they involve the locals in protecting the area and, uh, and helping them manage it properly and entertaining the tourists, which is not, very, not fantastic when the tourist revenue stream turns off because they basically create a uh, tourist park. So the conservancies are, are very much about um, uh, hunting reserves for the very rich, like for those who like to kill elephants, and um, uh, uh, safari tours uh, for uh, the rest of us. And in Africa, they uh, they have these militarized uh, uh, forces, militarized park guards, and uh, they basically kick the locals out. <laughs> so they steal their land, <laughs> which and they, they steal a lot of land. That's why uh, the uh, Maasai uh, peoples in the uh, um, uh, in Tanzania are making making some headlines from time to time. They're interested uh, 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 people who are interested in the topic would, would uh, check out uh, Survival International, which is at uh, the, uh, the front of that uh, of these battles. Uh, they uh, usually have some very, very good information. And so um, what justifies all of that is um, uh, carbon accounting. So it's basically the other side of uh, this uh, carbon signature uh, uh, nonsense on, uh, of the green tech thing. You, you have these carbon stocks that you justify protecting, right? And so you get paid to protect them. And uh, there are other carbon stocks you get paid to grow trees on it, which is another shenanigan where you basically, uh, it's usually commercial plantations, so like palm oil, rubber, <laughs> teak, <laughs> that type of thing. So what they do for that, they, they, they steal land from indigenous peoples, plains, grasslands, which usually don't have enough um, water uh, to sustain a forest, to support a forest. And then they grow trees on top, which obviously is a dismal failure uh, uh, very frequently. Like it's it's Really shambles, shambles, and uh, for for that the um, uh, uh, Chris Lang is, is a good source uh, uh, to check out for those who are interested. It's a it's a real shenanigan. Like uh, the this carbon accounting thing is 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 really bizarre when you think about it. The carbon accounting also allows to um, uh, to justify things like um, uh, like biomass energy. Right, and uh, so, but, uh, which is also covered inside the um, uh, planet of the, human, of the human movie, right? He, he actually starts with that, and uh, so the way, the way they justify uh, burning biomass is uh, also through carbon finance. You have these stocks of carbon, and from a year to the next, as you grow trees and you harvest trees, on average, it stays the same. Right, and so because you're replanting the trees, you're not going to count uh, the uh, land use change, which is the key. It's not a land use change. Like uh, in in their accounting system, uh, the um, uh, field tree stumps is a forest because it's going to get replanted soon. <laughs> and. Um, which is like, it's completely bizarre. And, and so like the deeper I, I, I dug into this and, and basically the, the, le the less of it made sense. And it, it, it grew on me one day that um, I, I wanted to fight from, you know, from the inside. And so that's when I joined the, um, uh, I latched onto really uh, a few environmental groups. Now I latched onto several of them uh, like which ones didn't, doesn't really matter, but it it quickly dawned on me that I was wasting my time. But I stuck on to to actually you know see what was uh, going on. It's awkward. Like uh, you know, there's there's document that you see circulate from time to time where uh, like CIA uh, like organizes uh, 
uh, disorganized is really uh, opposition groups on the inside by asking, you know, like slowing everything down, making uh, um, meetings inefficient and, and things like that, like wasting time on every possible thing. It's exactly that. That it, it's it's exactly that meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting is it just it's nowhere. And I sat inside a um, uh, a a meeting. It was uh, uh, with like I've sat as as an observer. There there was this representative of the uh, European industry who was you know explaining yeah, but we need we actually need fossil fuels. Like you know like we can't function without them. Like what what are I I get that we need to reduce them, but what are we supposed to do with it? And the experts say, yeah, but you need to reduce them. And like, and that was a whole meeting like for it. It, it lasts for an hour. It's like pure waste of time. Uh, nothing constructive. Uh, an, another thing is uh, like they're um, they're driven by attention metrics, which I, which is very surprising. And uh, there's this. Um, uh, um, uh, I think he's Belgian. Uh, Le biais vert. Uh, he made this short movie, uh, 10 Minutes, Anita, which uh, features like this Greta type of figure who um, is completely zoned out and bored by what her activism. It, it's a short movie. That, there's this one scene inside that, that, that I have seen this before. And it's, uh, imagine a scene where the, she, she, she goes into this meeting and there's these marketers like, and we have this amount of views and this amount of followers and this amount of extra uh, media attention. And th it's exactly that. It's, and I have literally sat through a meeting where it was that. And at the end, you had the guy who was like the activist leader and like, now I need you to tweet this using that specific hashtag. And yes, now we have 500 of them and like, let's make a trend. And like, exactly that. Now, I think in their defense, in their defense, I, I do think that uh, part of that is because of the way they are funded and that uh, their funders are driving them uh, using metrics and uh, media attention metrics of, the, uh, uh, of that nature. So uh, there, there might be something um, uh, uh, in that area, but uh, at any rate, it's, 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 not it's not effective. I think that a more general remark that we can say is that um, so like clearly they're controlled up opposition and uh, with the benefit of hindsight, I would say that any any group that is uh, about disempowering people is controlled opposition, right? Uh, any, any activity that dis that creates like entitled frustration really uh, is is controlled opposition, but uh, uh, yeah, inaction promoting inaction. And I think that actually like when you when when you look at it, both sides of the narrative are are controlled opposition in reality, I think. Because um even on our side of the debate where we're like, no, but the science is wrong, uh it does not promote action. It does not promote getting out of the conundrum that we're in where you have two groups fighting one another, there's no constructive, uh, uh, let's solve this type of uh, thing going on, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, I think some of them might be by design uh, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, like especially, especially fossil fuel interests, but um, uh, quite a few others, like, you know, stuck in the two party paradigm uh, uh, type of situation where you know it's left thing and we're on the right thing and but when actually both sides are to my mind uh, controlled by the same puppeteers uh, in the background it's uh, okay. uh, uh the um, wrong kind of green cory morning cory morning stars work would be a great place uh, to look okay. for for that type uh, of information she does a fantastic job at, uh, at documenting this, uh, Paul Tudenek as well. Uh, he is uh, Winter Oak on Twitter, Winter Oak Press. So, okay. uh, two fantastic sources for that. Um, um, I, I do have a question here. I want to make sure, sure I, I want to make sure I understand you on the controlled opposition, like for uh, Extinction Rebellion, for example. Do you think they're controlled op uh, opposition? Controlled by who? Who's uh, controlling them? Yeah. Um, uh, the, this, they're funded by conservancy. Uh, Extinction Rebellion, as I recollect, they are, uh, uh, if, if memory serves me well, they are controlled 
control. Their leadership is uh, has have ties to a uh, Chatham House, uh, which is like a, a a globalist think tank in London, uh, like very very private club. Uh, you you'd need to double check on the uh, on Corey Morningstar's website for that. She she does a she does a very good job at exposing them. Um, uh, all of them, uh, the, cons the, the conservancies uh, are, are, are part of the problem, really. Uh, they are like completely bought and paid for uh, by uh, billionaire philanthropies. Uh, they are philanthropies, really, uh, at the service of billionaires. Uh, the, um, uh, the conservancies, what they, what they do besides uh, kicking locals out is they, they develop the land, really. And uh, the leadership of the conservancies, uh, uh, for, for good sources of, uh, for that, you'd uh, want to check out the work of uh, Stephen Corey. Uh, he was the, uh, the former CEO of uh, Survival International. And uh, um, Mordesai Ogada, uh, who also does a fantastic job of documenting this. Um, so th basically, like they open minds, really. <laughs> they keep the locals out to protect nature, but ah, this area over there, there's some mining to do to save the planet by making green tech, mm -hmm. shit like that. So we're going to exploit that part, right? But the rest will protect. <laughs> and then you know, there's a forest, so we need to clear the trees. And and the leadership, uh, they um, we always talk about the revolving doors with. Uh, politics, but the revolving doors also exist between corporations and uh, big conservancies and uh, big NGOs. It's a very small club uh, at the top uh, of all these organizations. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, does can, that answer your question? It does. And it brings up another question. Can you describe in a little more detail what you mean by the resolve, uh, revolving doors? Is it where you do something for one organization with the idea you're going to be rewarded when you move to a different one? What what is the idea of the revolving doors? I think they're all they're they're all it's. Uh, I've come to understand this as, as a, a class corruption, if you will, uh, to borrow Marx's term. Uh, it's uh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, and it's perfectly normal. Like when you're when you're in a business uh, circle, like I, I have been in business circles, like you, it's normal to. Uh, uh, help each other out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like you, you do someone a favor, and then you can ask a favor from someone else, from that person in the future, or or not. Maybe you give a few uh, a favor to someone else uh, as a group, and uh, as a group they scratch each other's back, which is good nature, really. Like you go to the same schools, you attend the same Ivy League schools, uh, you have the you live in the same areas, like. You work as a as a class. I still struggle, even though like the evidence is obvious and to our faces uh, nowadays. But I, I I still struggle to accept the idea that there's like some some secretive uh, organization in the background. Like I've I've been a manager. And it's very hard to um, uh, to 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 completely control an organization from the top down. Uh, I, I think there's always a a degree of leeway and taking advantage of things uh, for personal gain uh, at every step along the way, or, or simply to improve things uh, which are not right. Um, so I, 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 I still struggle to believe in uh, like wholesale conspiracy, but the, um, uh, the idea that as a group, uh, uh, a bunch of people with shared interests and uh, shared financial interests really, uh, uh, help each other out as they go from one organization to another, even if it looks benign, and it's not benign, but even if it looks benign, I, like, it's there. It's there. Uh, uh, one example I cite in, in my book is the, um, uh, uh, the, the use of state resources. Uh, in the first chapter of my book, I, I mentioned that, um, where you, um, you have this uh, biomass company, which uh, is destroying forests, really, in, uh, uh, in the um, South Carolina uh, area. And uh, well, throughout the globe, throughout the South, really, of uh, the United States. And they, they just raise forests. That's what they do. And they, like, they don't raise the forest themselves. They collect the forestry waste. 
and they make wood pellets. And for that, they um, so it's a it's polluting activity that creates all sorts of uh, um, uh, sawdust, which is not very healthy for the locals and uh, or the workers for that matter. And um, they, they collect all sorts of, sub of subsidies. And these subsidies are, you know, like normal, right? That's how capitalism works. Uh, you, you get the state to sponsor uh, uh, your activity and you take a check, right? And, but all these leaders, they're part of the same group. So it, it's, I, I, I think really it, uh, class corruption is the way uh, to look at it uh, more than individual uh, uh, corruption. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you wrote a book called A Natural Language. Can you tell us a little yes. bit about that and how you came to write it? That's such a good question, actually. There's something that I had been going on in my mind since uh, early adulthood uh, on the nature of uh, cognition, which I wanted to put in writing one day. And it uh, so that and that's that's why the title of the book, the topic of the book is more in environmental issues. Uh, it was in part because I wanted to write a book to denounce what I had found in on environmental issues and like it could feel a bit vain at the time, but many people, uh, you know, may, many people have already documented everything I write, so like. Uh, it's just not a book that says the same thing. Uh, but at the same time, I was also uh, uh, finding uh, solutions as I was learning about agroecology and uh, how to grow food. And so I, that, that's, how the, that's how the book came about. And uh, I think the thing point was a challenge. There was uh, one activist leader who uh, uh, challenged me one day, like, I, I dumped it into a meeting like i think the science is wrong uh i i don't think the i don't think it's about fossil fuel and we'll get to that in a in a few minutes and he was like look like the science is the science like write a book if you if you feel differently and so i did <laughs> he hasn't read it by the way okay uh, all right he doesn't uh, he doesn't answer my email and so, yeah, um, uh, actual opposition, uh, to get back on topic, is, um, to my mind, about empowering. It's about action. It's about uh, giving others the tools they need to take action, to, you know, address, to resolve the fear that they have. Now, what that could look like for uh, uh, activists, like for, for green activists, uh, is um, so reducing fossil fuel, right? They're always, always, always talking about reducing fossil fuels. And it seems to me that, uh, and it seemed to me at the time, like that's, for, that's part of why I joined activist groups is to, you know, permaculture and all. And one of the first things that you learn is like the importance of food in your, in your uh, energy consumption. And so grow food because that's how you, uh, reduce your energy consumption and you can live more sustainably. And I was like, yeah, just promote that, promote growing food. Simple, like problem solved, right? And it makes sense because when you when you look at the at your energy like at, at the energy signature of uh, developing countries, like it's really a, a Rube Goldberg machine uh, of sorts. Like the amount of effort that goes into uh, getting a consumer to purchase a food item off the shelf of a supermarket is phenomenal. Like, and, and even the permaculture videos that try to capture this do not capture the full extent of the absurdity. Like, you have an entire supply chain to feed into instead of having a shovel, right? And that entire supply chain also requires that you have a military and a police force to defend and uh, surveil that supply chain because no one wants to live near a mine. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and no one wants to let go of their land to create a mine. So you need to boot the locals out, which is what these services are, are doing in Africa. Uh, then you need uh, the army or park guards to secure that mine. Uh, and so on and so forth. And 
no one wants to live near a trash incinerator downstream. So you also need police to, because else the locals would just like, hello, we don't need this. We don't want this thing here. I mean, a, a trash, by the way, is a very good proxy of energy use. If you look at the amount, if you look inside of your trash, you have a good proxy of what, uh, what the energy signature of the items that you're purchasing is. And the, you need to do this all the way down the, uh, the supply chain, right? And, and food is everywhere. The signature of food is absolutely everywhere. Like, look, look into things like plastic culture, the fertilizers, the, uh, the, the machinery, the tractors, the processing, refrigeration, transportation, packaging, all of it. Like, all of that goes into food, right? And it's a small signature every single time, but it's day after day after day after day after day after day after day. It's like a yacht with a teak deck, huge energy signature, but you do it once. Food every single day. And uh, food also have, uh, has imperialist uh, ramifications that uh, uh, are, they, they really do matter. Like um, the, uh, after World War II, um, we set up the World Trade Organization, right? Yep. And one of the rules of the World Trade Organization is that you cannot have food subsidies unless they were already in place when you joined. And so Europe and the United States have food subsidies for that reason. And every other country does not. I did not know that. Uh-huh. And so what that what happens then is that this the uh, Western uh, Western food sector puts local farmers in places like Africa up to business. And then the World Bank is in. And now the function of the World Bank is to um, take communities out of subsistence farming, which is to say autonomous, like they have food, for, food sovereignty, and to instead fund modern agricultural plantations and mining and that type of thing. And so what, what they end up doing, like the combination of the two is that you, you take subsistence farmers who are, were making a living before the WTO, before independence and the WTO, and then they get replaced by corporations that set up tea plantations or homework plantations all over the place, uh, which are funded by carbon credits. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a nice well, uh, 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 mm -hmm. it, it's it's well oiled cobs, let's put it that way, uh, and it's part of a complete system. And then the migrants they go to cities or they go to the United States or Europe. The, the, the poor farmers who have nothing to do because they lost their land and everything. So it, it's like, yeah. <laughs> it, it's not good. And so anyway, uh, uh, it seemed to me at the time that uh, promoting promoting uh, gardening and urban farming would be the right thing to do. And uh, it's it's... We're noting in passing how uh, how much more productive a garden is than a um, agricultural uh, field. Like uh, Western agriculture with machinery is one of the least efficient things that you can do. Like you have like a corn field with corn after corn after corn after corn after corn. Whereas in a garden, you can stack things. You can uh, you can succession plant all over the place. You can have seedlings that are uh, ready to go when you take a plant out. Like it's phenomenally more productive as a, a food system. Um, uh, in, um, uh, in the aftermath, after the, um, uh, the USSR uh, fell, uh, Cuba used to depend on it for its food supply, for its grains. And overnight that ceased. And so what they ended up doing is create all sorts of urban farms. And so they have a very, very strong gardening culture, urban gardening culture in Cuba. And they have yields on the order of 20 kilos uh, per square meter of garden bed, which is huge. It's really, really huge. And um, when you're in a good climate, like the one that I am at the moment, you like in a 100 square meter garden, you can get 400 kilos of food easily uh, by stacking things, by planting in three dimensions, by succession planting all over the place. Uh, 
it's really that much more, more productive. And uh, so that was part of the things that I wanted to promote as well is like a uh, more gardening culture. Uh, Korea style is a, another interesting one. They they eat a lot more fruit, uh, a lot more vegetables and fruits as well uh, than uh, uh, than Westerners. And so besides being a healthier diet, it's also a, a fairly bit more uh, productive. They have a maybe five, 10 times more productive per, uh, per unit of surface. So I'm, I'm just pulling a number out of my ass here, but um, it's it's a lot more. It's like really, really a lot more. Uh, Russia also. Uh, Russia, when the USSR fell, before that as well, but especially after the USSR fell, uh, they, they could not afford to feed themselves. So they they all they have this huge dacha culture, and they all have this uh, uh, this weekend house of sorts, uh, which uh, uh, I, my wife is Hungarian. We uh, lived there for a while. Uh, that that culture is also present in Hungary to a large degree. So everyone has a a, a a small garden outside the city where they go to during the weekend and they they grow fruit like there's like, like there's no tomorrow, and which which is really really nice because then you know like you get fresh fruit all year uh, during the growing season anyway, uh, and if you do it right you can get your you can get food all year round really, uh, including in uh, in places like uh, Hungary or or uh, Russia like with the uh, underground uh, greenhouse. So yeah, and uh, uh, one question that is like, what do the farmers do in that case? And the, the farmers can of course focus on other yields like you know regenerative uh, 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 grazing, so uh, grass-fed meat basically, uh, as well as other yields like fibers, uh, uh, growing hemp in particular. Hemp is really really useful product for all sorts of things. You make paper using it. Lots of paper, uh, much better yields than uh, uh, than with forests, where, than with uh, with wood. Like it's it's criminal that we don't make paper using hemp. Which means <laughs> hemp is fantastic. Anyway, so uh, that was that. Uh, another big uh, item, uh, uh, energy use item that I uh, is uh, heat. Right, so you heat your home. You you need heat to cook. You need heat for uh, and and for that uh, permaculture like introduced, introduced. I had no idea these things existed until I learned permaculture. It's a rocket mass heater. Uh, so for uh, for those in the audience who are not familiar, um, it you want to look up a rocket stove which works on the same principle as a, a the Dakota fire pit, and so it's like a, you have a, a heat riser, and you put the wood at the bottom. And because heat rises, this creates an air draft, which creates complete combustion. And what the, what you do with a rocket mass heater is that you basically put a barrel or some kind of container over it, and then you pipe the heat inside a mass of stone, and that stores the heat. And this allows to heat a home, so not with the fire itself, but with the stored heat inside the mass. And so that means that you can heat your home with stick wood. From the garden, from garden prunings and uh, from forestry waste and, and things like that. Uh, when we were in Hungary, we would take the car every uh, every several days, and we would fill the trunk with uh, stick wood that we pick up in the in nearby forests, and we we kept ourselves warm that way. Uh, so it's really, really, really uh, uh, efficient as a uh, as a way to get heat. Uh, you can also use it for uh, other things like uh, heating water or 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 cooking. Uh, you can cook on the barrel if you need to. Uh, it's uh, like I, I'm mentioning this because like there's going to be food sh uh, fuel shortages soon in Europe. Like uh, if you haven't invested in a rocket mass heater yet for your home, now is a good time. Still, you just need some bricks <laughs> yeah. I, that stores yeah. the heat, and that's that's really key. Like like storing that heat yeah. is is such a, like the cat loves it. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> By the way, the same principle uh, as the rocket mass heater could be used to um, uh, to soak up a smokestack. I'm I'm fairly sure. Uh, so as as everyone in the audience will surely know, uh, plants love carbon dioxide, and you so you could take the smoke smokestack, the industrial one, like take the chimney and pipe it through like a drip irrigation system of sorts. You can imagine doing that, right? You take the heat out, store it somewhere, make hot water, whatever do something with it and the polluting smokestack then you send that into a hemp field and i 
we take the bet that the hemp would know what to do with the carbon dioxide and some water. <laughs> okay. Now, hemp okay. is interesting because it is it it soaks up toxins, all sorts of toxins. And tobacco is another uh, one that does that, but hemp is like a phenomenal grower. And um, so we could also depollute the areas, uh, depollute the smokestacks uh, that way, quite possibly. Um, I, I'd love to do the experiment if, if there's like a, some billionaire funders, uh, whoever, uh, whoever watched this, like I, I'd love to do that experiment or so, someone who, a uh, researcher who, can, who would like to try that out. Uh, because that, that would actually absorb uh, a big chunk, I think, of the uh, industrial smoke smokestacks, uh, and we we could make use of it. There, there's probably a business case that there's probably a business case, I think, uh, as well, where you, you basically send that to farmers and and they they grow whatever they need with it. I I don't think uh, food uh, because uh, because of the toxins. But uh, uh, things like fiber, why not? The, the more general point of, of permaculture is to highlight uh, holistic management, really. And uh, so that revolves around two, two key ideas, which uh, both of which help reduce energy use. One is to, to design around more than one function. Every, everything needs to be about more than one thing, ideally. Uh, it's not always possible, but ideally you strive to design your system that way. Uh, so it's not just about uh, producing a flame. You also collect the heat, make use of it, pipe it through whatever, like more than one thing. Uh, and the other is about designing around minimal input and minimal waste rather than optimized output. And this is this is a, a, a this is an amazing idea. When, once you once you get used to it like that, uh, it, it's it's like you you take a uh, take meat uh, right so you the meat and you can trash the meat at the end or you can feed it to your dog or you can feed it you can put it into a bucket and uh, that the bugs will then eat it and then that's chicken feed healthy proteins for the chickens. Like the, everything can be reused and you want to design around reusing things as much as possible. Uh, and find, finding alternative uh, uses so that you do not end up with waste. If you, if you have waste at some point, you did something wrong really. And we as a society produce a lot of waste. And uh, so yeah, permaculture. Uh, and, and so that's nice and all, but it would not eliminate the Carbon hockey stick, which is the main main theme of my book, really. Uh, it, now, the the reason I say that is that uh, uh, of the twenty twenty lockdowns, uh, they they highlighted how much energy we used as a society that was incompressible, but it also highlighted how little link there was between fossil fuel consumption and the carbon hockey stick, like the thing just continue to increase like clockwork it did its usual wiggle like it does every single year and the reason for that of course is that it has nothing to do with it it has actually something to do with soil now uh, i'm not the first to say that uh, uh, far from it actually uh, but to the best of my knowledge i have not found anyone who was able to to explain why so um let me try to do that um, uh, the key to understand this is um, that uh, uh, tilling and harvesting both produce uh, carbon dioxide. Now, the reason they do so is that uh, they uh, they produce decomposition, uh, like the, the fungi and the bacteria inside the soil will start decomposing uh, plant matter, the dead plant matter, because you killed it because you harvested or because you killed it uh, by tilling. And um, so th it, this is like an enormous amount uh, of emissions. Every single year, year after year, every spring, you can see on NASA visualizations that the plume of carbon dioxide erupts out of uh, w the Western Hemisphere and uh, agricultural areas. And every autumn, likewise, plume of carbon dioxide that erupts all over the place. And it's basically farmers working. But at the same time, farmers have been working throughout like the past 
several thousand years. So that's not actually the import the explanation. Uh, it is important, but it's not the full explanation. Um, I I struggled for a while to explain to myself like why would this cause a problem now, but not in the past. And it's around that time when I found I, I came across a movie uh, that uh, that led me to the to the answer. It was a, a movie about the unsustainability of Swedish Swedish forest period. I forget the name of it exactly. Uh, it was a Swedish made new movie. I'll try to find the, the reference for those who are uh, interested. And what that did to me was highlight that clear cutting, forest clear cutting, uh, produces an enormous amount of emissions. Now, uh, there's a whole area of research about, about how much uh, that is. And it's basically on the order of a few kilograms of carbon dioxide uh, per square meter. Now, for those who are uh, not good with numbers, that works out to about 10 tons of carbon dioxide per acre. Okay, so you clear a forest, you get 10 tons of carbon dioxide per acre, and this stops when the canopy recovers. Okay, so once the trees are grown enough and the decomposition is going to stop eventually, but more importantly, there's plants all on top that are blocking, that are soaking the soil emissions up. It's not 10, like poof overnight. It's um, a kilo per square meter over, or uh, a few kilos per square meter over a year, two years in total, right? So it's, it's slow, it's slow enough that plants can absorb it. And it turns out that thinning a forest does not produce these emissions. And that is key. And so here I was wondering, like, why is it that when you clear a forest, you get 10 tons of carbon dioxide per acre? Those go away when you thin the forest. And like, it's the emissions of a small town, right? So like, why are we not talking about this? Why are we not asking the loggers, like, please thin your forest instead of, you know, clear cuts? And <laughs> that would be a useful thing. And the answer is we're not counting them. It's, we're not counting them because of forestry map. Remember, the, um, uh, um, what justifies biomass is that on the long term, you cut the forest, grow a tree, grow the, regrow the forest, and in the long term, you have a fixed carbon stock. And so that's zero emission fuel right there because it counts as decomposition and because the trees regrow, then you no longer you don't need to worry about the details on the ground of what happens, but actually that shields the realities of avoidable emissions out of you. And I uh, so um, uh, climate scientists usually uh, uh, object here that we are counting these emissions, uh, and I will invite them to uh, understand the difference between uh, land use change and land use emissions for starters. And we do count some emissions, land use emissions, like changes in carbon stock. But those two are long-term measurements that do not factor the instantaneous uh, uh, situation on the ground. So actually we are not counting them. And I, uh, I'd be happy to be proven wrong, but I, I, ha I have yet to see the documentation that, that says otherwise. Uh, now, we adopted clear cutting at the turn of the 20th century. And the reason we did that was because paper. We uh, started using paper massively with the advent of uh, uh, modern education at the end of the 19th, early 20th century. That produced a lot of demand for paper and the Swedish uh, foresters innovated at the time. I think it was the Swedish and maybe the Germans, I don't remember, but I, I have a, a blank here. But uh, Nordic, and and so that basically corresponds to when the carbon copy stick starts. Now something else happens on farm fields at the same time, which is we um, uh, fields like there's an exodus 
that goes from uh, from the um, uh, rural areas to cities, right? And as they did, they would sell fields, and they would like farmers would get bigger and bigger and bigger fields, and so they would rationalize their fields and they would remove the hedgerows. And at the turn of the 20th century, what they did is remove even more hedgerows to make room for tractors. Right? So where in the past you would have small parcels surrounded by trees, nowadays you have huge swath of farm fields that get uh, tilled uh, year after year after year. And um, uh, there's a further development on farm fields, which is that um, uh, there were improvements in plowing technologies uh, in the late 19th century, which allowed, which were coincidental with a move west in the United States. So that's when the farmers arrived in the Great Plains recently. And so that allowed to plow the Great Plains at the same time. And so the Great Plains did not have hedgerows at the time, but because now you could plow them instead of having bison run up and like graze them, then uh, all of a sudden you have all these farming emissions that uh, erupt at the, around the same time. So I think it's a combination of both. What the hedgerows do is three things. They, uh, first off, it's a tree that absorbs carbon emissions from tilling and harvesting. It blocks the wind, which keeps the carbon dioxide around. And uh, last but not least, it keeps the fungi alive, right? The, the fungi uh, does not die around the hedge because the hedge keeps it alive. So the, um, once you remove the hedgerows, you basically keep the, you kill the fungi as well when you till. Uh, so that leads to a straightforward way to, um, to, to solve the problem, right? Uh, is to simply put the hedgerows back. And you can do that, uh, like the loggers can, can, could thin, yeah. Uh, there are good reasons to thin, by the way. Uh, like trees grow faster when you thin. <laughs> it's an excellent reason to, to do it. Uh, and, uh, but like, you know, maybe the farmers, will, uh, maybe the loggers will not uh, want to do that. Uh, but they could plant using alley cropping systems, right? Where uh, you have like a, a row and then a row of trees, a row of clear cut, a row of tree, and that keeps hedges, quote unquote, uh, in, in the area. And the farmers could do the same. That could be some, the, the simplest way to do it. Yeah. Um, I got the objection one day from a uh, someone who knew a thing or two about growing corn, uh, which was that corn does not like uh, uh, shade, Dude. which is true. But um, uh, alley, cropping, alley cropping, you can have like fairly wide alleys with lots of light in the middle. So uh, it seems to me that uh, that's, that's not a valid objection to my mind. Uh, but uh, still, like, welcome one, regardless. Uh, to my mind, any, any well-designed system that revolves around intercropping uh, would work. Uh, so let me give you uh, two examples. Uh, one would be, um, the, there are some regenerative farming experiments where you have uh, farmers growing crop in between alleys of, um, uh, of prairies, right? So they have like a... a Two, two yard, three, three, two, three yard band of native prairies, right? And then they have a band of crop, uh, which is can be fairly large, and that allows to reintroduce uh, local wildlife, right? the The idea for them is to like to work with nature to have uh, uh, to to save habitat and to reintroduce uh, beneficials all over the place. Uh, but uh, to to my mind, I'm fairly certain that that would work as well, and or simply to plant inside clover. The clover is a nitrogen fixer, and one way to get nitrogen on the field is simply plant inside of clover. Uh, you don't even need to mow the thing, just plant. <laughs> plant inside, and then you get like, and it's, it's pretty like fairly significant amount of, uh, of nitrogen at that. And uh, not, you, you don't get the same germination rate, right? But like, it's still, still pretty, pretty good. And then you don't need to spray a uh, fertilizer on the, on the field, which is also not very, uh, good for them like, it's a salt really mm -hmm. so it, it's i mean unless you're using you're using a uh, urea it's, a, it's really a salt um which is not great so like that that seems to me that uh land stewards could reverse this and that could be um uh, a very good way to uh to help the activists as well 
right? Uh, like here's how you reduce, here's how you eliminate the, the carbon hockey stick uh, is to simply uh, manage the landscape a little bit differently. And it's really not that differently. And then we, we take the problem out. Okay, so I do want to, I want to ask you a question on the big picture here to make sure I understand you. That we're uh -huh. told we're told that humans have increased the CO two level from about yes. about two eighty to four twenty. But what yeah. percent of that increase do you think was caused by burning fossil fuels? If so any? that's an uh, excellent question. Uh, there was a, a paper which got uh, uh, I forgot the name of the author. Uh, I, I cite him in my book. So it's, it's Kenneth something Barrows. Uh, uh, it it was uh, posted on Twitter by friends of science at around the time when I was finishing my book, and it was like, ah, there's the number, uh, twelve percent fossil fuel was the number he found. Uh, now the the paper got all sorts of critiques. Uh, to, uh, I'll give you the link uh, mm -hmm. so you can add it to the show notes. Uh, the the paper got hammered and hammered and hammered. Uh, because the authors make um, statements like, uh, and therefore uh, the carbon hockey stick is not uh, man-made or uh, that kind of thing, uh, which like everyone was up and on, like, obviously. Uh, and, but I haven't seen anyone contradict the 12% number. No, and uh, by the way, 12% is enormous. Like when, when I first came across the number, like the, the reason it, it caught my interest was like, Hold on, because like fossil fuel compared to natural emissions, like fraction, it's like three, five percent, something like that. Like, and and so I asked myself, like, how is it that it's so huge? How do we even get twelve percent? Like, it's it's impossibly high, right? And I think the answer is uh, because it's clearly a tailpipe. Like, when you drive your car, like, it's going to get soaked up by by. By the nearby, by the nearest tree. Like, like wait, wait. When you're around a cornfield, there is not, a, there's nothing, no carbon dioxide around the cornfield. Like, hardly anything. Uh, during the hot, the peak summer, nada, zero, zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, like within meters of it, like hardly undetectable. Uh, plant comes by with you know tailpipe that gets sucked up, right? It gets soaked up. The tree in the city is going to soak up the carbon dioxide of the cars. Uh, so it's not those emissions. It's not the emissions on the ground. It has to be something higher above the canopy. And it, I think it comes from the industrial smoke smokestacks. So like a, a coal power station or a, a steel power uh, a steel a steel plant, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, airplanes another uh, there's there's no plants when your airplane is screwing uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and so i i think that is why there is so much of it uh, uh, and it lingers around uh, a little bit longer uh, maybe uh, i don't know if the 12 num if the 12 percent number is is 100 accurate uh, maybe it's a bit more maybe it, i don't think it really matters to to, to me the essential point is uh, we can we can eliminate like the other eighty eight percent with simple land stewardship stewardship uh, stewardship changes. So there's there's absolutely no reason to be fussing about fossil fuel. And if we do ever want to fuss about them, uh, uh, what we said earlier, like you can take the smokestack and pipe it into a hemp field, and then you soak that up too. So <laughs> okay, so yeah, so we're we're encouraged to believe that one hundred percent of that increase from two eighty to four twenty was from fossil fuels. We're encouraged to believe right. that, but it might be more like twelve. I want to make sure. It, yes, out of yes. that increase, yes. it might be twelve, and the rest of the eighty eight is land use. Or do you think there's any deal where it's a lag? But after the medieval warm period, it's been eight hundred years, and it has something to do with the lag from the warming in the past, or any other natural change. Or would it be 280 still if humans uh, never existed uh, over uh, 1860? Oh, so to me, there's not a doubt in my mind that uh, like the vast majority is attributable to topsoil loss. Like topsoil loss is a real problem. Like a huge. We have 50 or so. Like unless the farmers change uh, the way they grow food, uh, we have 50 uh, growing seasons left or so. Uh, it something needs to change in our uh, food systems. 
uh, at minimum, they need to switch to uh, regenerative agriculture. And uh, and that would be a welcome change. And it's a it's an easy one. Like like if there are farmers in the audience, like absolutely look into it. Like happy to organize a workshop with you guys. Uh, like it is not a hard one. And there there's some excellent podcasts that that cover the topic as well. With 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 vastly more knowledgeable people than I am. Uh, the uh, it is not a hard change. And then you uh, depend less on inputs. You depend less on um, uh, uh, on ups and downs in the marketplace because you're probably going to be uh, diversifying what you're what you're producing. Like it is a good change, and uh, if on top of that we can add some trees near near uh, near uh, crops, then we also solve the uh, carbon hockey stick problem at the same time, which would be a good thing because it would make the climate scientists look like complete clowns, and <laughs> it would turn the uh, narrative into a dog's breakfast uh, but i do not think that it would uh stop propaganda we need to get real about this the uh, fear and anger are really by design uh, it's um th there are some string pullers uh, and they are uh, ruling by dividing and conquering uh, as uh, string pullers do and they work from behind the scene and uh you know, like it's the lot of billionaires and multi-billionaires and multi-multi-multi-billionaires and uh, philanthropic interests and like, like a, a everyone's favorite conspiracy theories, supervillains. Uh, we all know them. Uh, no need to give names here and get you in trouble. Um, I, uh, uh, for, for those who are not private with conspiracy theories, uh, I would highly invite you to actually look into them because they are not conspiracy theories. They are very often uh, conspiracy like realities that you can just look up online and read the docs straight out of the horse's mouth and see for yourself that it is not what the media says. Um, I think the, the, the part that captures my that captured my uh, attention most was the religious uh, aspects of it. Um, the, uh, the religious ties of nature uh, conservancies should not be ignored. Um, uh, if you take the discourse of uh, like, ooh, we need to protect nature, da, 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 uh, of uh, environmentalists, uh, very often when you replace nature with God, you will have a good church sermon. And this is not an accident. Like every, uh, and I really mean every, uh, conservancy, uh, the, the forefathers of conservancy were all authoritarians. They were white supremacists. They were racists, they were uh, colonialists, they were everything that the leftist activists despise and denounce, even though they are actually pursuing their work <laughs> without realizing, which is a bit comical, but you know, whatever. Uh, no, it, uh, it, these, are, these, are not, these are not nice people. And um, like the authoritarianism, I, I like to point out that uh, they protect nature the way they protect their daughters. So they lock her up, right, to, to keep uh, other people out. And uh, the, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, they, 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 they fear nature. It's, it's, a, it's very much a fear-driven agenda. Uh, authoritarianism in general is a fear-driven agenda. And uh, I think the, the climate agenda is uh, probably be better understood as uh, some kind of spiritual war. Uh, and the, the the events of the past few years, and uh, it, you know, like there's this digital control grid that is being engineered around us with the digital currencies, uh, uh, like central bank digital currencies that are being uh, rolled out in some countries, tested in others, like, and that's clearly part of their agenda. Uh, there are uh, the 5G towers and the um, uh, the uh, the efforts to to get us chip really, uh, or to at least have some kind of digital tag where you can monitor and surveil all the time. The the digital surveillance grid uh, at large uh, is part of the uh, of the same thing. The geoengineering efforts, like I am. Uh, 
lucky enough to live in an area where uh, there is very, very little Spain. But the um, uh, where where we lived in Hungary, the skies were covered, covered with chemtrails, from lack of a better term, uh, uh, all the time. And you you can tell that it's it's chemical in nature because a normal contrail dissolve dissipates, I think it disappears after a minute or two. And uh, when it lingers on for hours on end, which it does uh, more often than not in Western countries that I've been to, then, you know, that, uh, clearly they're spraying something in the air. What are they spraying in our skies? Uh, like geoen geoengineering watch? Did you, did you uh, interview uh, Dane uh, Wivington yet? Or no, it, no. I'll, I'll have him over. Okay. <laughs> if you want to talk about the real climate change, he's the guy. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> it's a fantastic chap. Uh, there was an interview of him uh, recently on uh, uh, The Last American Vagabond. Uh, for, the, for those who are interested, uh, uh, fantastic work he's doing. Anyway, so the uh, June engin engineer, and uh, it, it seems to me that the uh, the people in charge of our clown show are uh, are engineering like when you look at it from afar. There's we have plagues, right? We're we have looming food shortages because of all the chaos that the plagues have uh, created. Uh, now they're rolling out bird flu uh, using PCR tests, so it's going to be the same shenanigan, and they're trying to to kill the chicken fox. Uh, using that, they're murdering like, millions of birds already uh, with that. So, like, we're we're heading towards a future with very little meat, except what is uh, um, except bugs, basically. So, <laughs> if you don't have chickens in your garden, you're probably going to be eating bugs soon enough. Uh, so, get chickens. Uh, it's a good piece of advice for for those who have do not have some yet. Uh, the, uh, so the we're going to have crop failures because of the lack of fertilizer. There was a lack of fertilizer shortage last year, uh, or this year rather. Uh, th this is going to have consequences on the harvest uh, and on uh, next year's food availability. Uh, there have been uh, feed, animal feed uh, shortages or uh, skyrocketing prices. This is also going to have an impact. Uh, so we're, we're heading for a period of uh, potential, uh, uh, maybe not famines immediately, but um, less food abundance, let's put it that way. Uh, I, I think there's still time to react as communities. Like if we all start growing food overnight, uh, to my mind, uh, there's no question that we can turn this around. Like, you know, like you can literally produce 400 kilos of food in 10 square meters. I mean, in 10 by 10, by 10 uh, uh, square meter. Uh, for those who doubt that, there is actually a, um, a short video uh, in, of a family in Sydney by um, uh, some ecological outfit. I forgot the happen films, I think. Uh, like, it, it's short and it's lovely. It's, it's uh, but like it, that kind of thing does exist. And we could do this in like, so many places, uh, warm areas especially, colder areas. It's more difficult because you need greenhouses. But like we can turn this, uh, we can. The, the it's not inevitable yet that we have uh, food shortages all over the place. If we all grow food next year, uh, we'll be fine. Um, if not, we're going to have chaos and cities full of uh, hungry people. And hungry people who have not eaten for a few days tend to behave like actual zombies. So this is not going to be a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's a bit of a clown show, really. And uh, for like, there, there, there's this uh, uh, thing called Project Blue Beam, which I invite uh, 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 find members of the audience to actually look up if they have never heard from that. That one is a is a fun one. It's basically um, uh, the idea is uh, uh, let's create a new age religion. Of sorts, and so it's a it's a four step project. But uh, w the main one it involves to to use holographic displays in the skies, and um, to 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 have a divine intervention of sorts. And um, the uh, one of the one of the aspects of um, 
uh, of geoengineering uh, is a it's a change in the ionosphere uh, memory serves, uh, which potentially allows to send uh, radio waves inside the that that can interact with the the brain. I um, there's a fantastic conference by an actual military guy uh, who explains this, uh, which I will try to locate so that you can post it into your uh, uh, the show notes. Uh, it's completely mind-boggling what they are, uh, what he says they are capable of doing. And I'm inclined to believe that he's, you know, like it's it's a West Point, uh, uh, it's a um, uh, a West Point uh, talk, if memory serves me well. So like th th this is this is something that they actually teach <laughs> to our military. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, you know. so so what are the most effective things we can do to fight the insanity? Do you think? Um, uh, I think I think we need to take back control and uh, like take back control of our lives, take back control of our communities uh, at every uh, at every step of the way. Uh, the The most important uh, thing that we need to do, I think, is to take back control of the debate. And by that, I mean uh, we need to. I think we need to stop fighting at each other. Uh, the the greenies are terrified. Like they, they are completely demoralized. Uh, what was that? A uh, former uh, KGB agent uh, that gave an interview where he was explaining, uh, like, uh, the people are demoralized. People are completely hopeless. You can present facts to them, they will not respond to facts. They will, they, they completely oblivious to reality. Like you could take them to a concentration camp and you. You tell them this is a concentration camp, and they will say, "No, no, no! This is a like a happiness area." They they can be that brainwashed, and 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 it's because you know like it's a long process. They they've been preparing this for for decades and decades and decades, as you explained. Uh, and this was an interview, as I recall, from the nineties. Like I, I I'll find you the interview for the show notes. But the um, it's we'll get nowhere not cooperating with them and uh which is why i think that uh the message that is in this podcast i think is important because there is a way to fight fossil fuel, to reduce fossil fuels which is actually which actually works against the agenda of uh the people behind uh the climate narrative uh it's to simply grow food in our communities and promote gardening promote urban farming like oh you want to reduce fossil fuels yes by all means here's how and like grow food this is going to reduce your problem and and promote growing food in school and promote like tell the council to create community gardens and tell the council to um uh, to to take back control of the communal areas and turn them into veggie patches and uh, let's grow fruit like let's get rid of all of these useless trees in our, in our cities like why are we not growing trees in our cities that I, I, I kid you not, like, I live in a village at the moment. There are coconut trees everywhere. Like, I, I will not run out of food, I can guarantee you that. There are coconut trees and banana trees absolutely everywhere. Communal areas are full of food. Uh, and if you, do, if you cannot afford the food to buy food, you just go with your machete, you, you whack two coconuts and you have your dinner. That's, a, that's it. Like, <laughs> There are eggs everywhere. The chicken, like I, I, I had some uh, some chickens the other day. They, so we we don't have chickens yet because we haven't moved into a field. But the uh, uh, the the neighbor's uh, rooster uh, came with a hen, and the hen for a couple of days is laying eggs into her into her garden. Like there are no uh, there are no uh, chicken uh, coops uh, in the area where I live. The chickens just go as they wish, <laughs> as, as do the dogs. Uh, it, it's it, there's food, and every city could look like this. Uh, we every city could be about uh, growing food, and so they want to. They're afraid about the carbon hockey stick. Tell them how to fix it. Tell them, yeah, this is like soil based thing actually, and here's why, and they don't count it. And like, and uh, this would win in court, by the way. Uh, in case there are lawyers in the audience, I am 100% sure that if we drop this into a case, we win the case. 100%, because they cannot put an explanation in front. Why do we ignore these 10 tons per acre of avoidable emissions? Why do we, why do we not count these things? They're avoidable, just, you know, avoid them. 
And, and so there's no reason for this policy about fossil fuels, none, none whatsoever. And um, so there, there's that. Um, and, and, you know, like in, in power, that, uh, they want, they, they're, they're concerned about social injustice. Lots of good things happen when you are not depending on uh, some oppressors for your food. Like if you are growing your own food and you do not want to work, you do not work. Simple as that. You have your water source because you're harvesting water from your roof. You have your heat source because you have some cuttings from, you don't need to work much after you have a functioning garden, functioning food system around you. It's, it's, it's really a lot less work uh, uh, for money anyway. Uh, it's still a lot of work on the property, but it's, uh, it's less work outside of that. And um, more generally, we can like use holistic management to create more abundance. Because uh, I think when the, one, of the, one of the key propaganda tools is giving the impression that everything is scarce, right? The, like, there's a limit of this, there's a limit of that, there's a limit of this, and like, there's only so much yield that you can corn your, that you can get per acre, right? But that's not true. If you, uh, if you remove the corn and you replace the corn with a whole bunch of other yields, you put this into an alley copy system, you work in three dimensions, you have, uh, like they do here, like they when they grow corn, they grow corn and they put a bean next to it mm -hmm. and they put some uh, pepper next to it and they put some squash. And so you have all these four uh, uh, crops that are growing on just on the same surface, really. They put them further apart. There's less corn yield total, but there's more yield overall. And you can do this with all sorts of production systems. And, um, so there, there, there's no fatality unless you're using machinery to extract the maximum yield for a single crop. And that's, that's what's call, actually causing the fatality. You can create far more abundance by diversifying the productions all over the place. So uh, that's it. And um, so my, my sense is empower the activists. That's the most important part. Uh, the other is to not let, your, uh, not, not let ourselves disempowered by their, by their statutes. Now, the thing to know about statutes is that they all, they were written by the elites in a way that they do not apply for them, right? So there's always going to be an exception in the statute itself or some kind of procedural problem in the statute that makes it so that the statute does not apply if they do not want to apply, right? And this was most obvious during, uh, during the um, uh, pandemic uh, after the injection rollout uh, because you had like, uh, say Biden in the U.S., he announced mandate, but they never passed the statute. It was just a the announcement; they never passed. It. <laughs> and then you had someone, someone down, further down the ranks, who said, "Yeah, yeah, there's a mandate now, so let's do this." But uh, and that, but there was no obligation for that person. So like, there's a procedural problem in there that could completely blows up. The, the entire uh, the entire process. Uh, another thing they that they they do is that they escape liability. So like uh, uh, they, I don't I don't want to get your your podcast. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. Let's go on. Yeah, and let's move on with that. But anyway, um, uh, another thing to 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 know about the uh, uh, the law is that law enforcers are expected to follow the law. And they are also expected to answer questions. And now um, cops ask questions, judges ask questions, and uh, you and I normally answer them, but you can fit that role. You can ask questions and they are, they are expected to actually answer and, and keep their cool as they answer. So you can use that against them and just incinerate everything that's, uh, every obligation that's thrown at you with question to completely nullify it. And you're going to, you're going to end up like question the facts, question the process and you will find a problem at the end always because they always 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 produce statutes that they can ignore if they want to always so that's the other uh, key point now uh, how we uh, uh, they, there are still people who are like uh, uh, inside the the narrative and and like uh, trying to enforce things uh, onto others and we need to deal with those as well so uh, my sense is that uh, they cannot do anything if they have no one on the ground to enforce it, right? They're completely powerless. If the cop is not enforcing the law, they are powerless. And uh, or if the school is not enforcing this or that mandate, they are powerless. And I think the way to uh, 
get compliance on that front is to simply say the truth. Like you have uh, someone who is imposing this or that mandate or enforcing this or that law, tell everyone around them, right? To tell their wife or their, their husband, uh, tell uh, tell their neighbors, kids out of that, of course, uh, tell the siblings, tell uh, colleagues, tell places where they shop, where they go to rest, like make it impossible for them to go outside without seeing this proving stairs all around them. And I do believe that it work because like no one can resist that type of pressure except a certified ghoul. And for those, just go for the left, just go for the lieutenants underneath them and they will have no one to enforce their edicts mm -hmm. as well. So I, I think we can take back control of our, uh, of our cities that way. Um, mm -hmm. Taking back control of judicial uh, authority, uh, this one is a matter of, um, we have a power as we the people uh, to uh, decide to apply the law or not as juries, right? Mm -hmm. And if a jury decides to not apply the law, enough times, then you get a thing called jury annulment, which basically the, the judge, follow judges, then say, well, yes, the people have decided that this law no longer applies, so this law is null and void, right? We can completely smash the legal system that way. We just need to, you know, like, if you're ever part of a jury, just not guilty, whatever the case, it's okay. I mean, unless it's murder, obviously, but you know, just not guilty. <laughs> Screw those laws. And uh, now there is a need for justice regardless. And it seems to me that the we can take back control of uh, justice by simply organizing a citizen's justice. And the, now, the way that would work is uh, you take at the community level, you gather uh, a, an odd number of people, right? Uh, and uh, they're going to serve as the jury. They elect one president who will preside over the hearings and the others get to decide and the president uh, uh, decides with the, the jury if necessary. And that way you can have law without all their shenanigans. And sure, like they could be lawyers, great. Like, you know, but it takes the law outside of the court system that they actually control. And uh, a lot of judges are bought and paid for, I think. I can't prove it obviously, but it seems to me that a lot of judges, they're not what they seem to be. Um, uh, another thing is that they, we need to take back control of our money supply. Now, uh, this is important because the, uh, and this was obvious as well during the, pan uh, the pandemic, uh, a lot of rules were enforced by using the, bub like not outright robbery, but although there was a bit of, of that as well, I, I understand, uh, but uh, budget strings to, uh, to schools, for instance. Uh, and we need to take that power out of their hands. And uh, it seems to me that the way that we could do that is to build a parallel economy that uh, that uses local currencies. Now, uh, local currencies. This was an experiment. There was an experiment done in the uh, during the Great Depression. Several experiments, really, uh, that worked fantastically well and so well that they uh, decided at the time to try to outlaw them. But like earlier point, laws do not go, like laws require law enforcement to apply them. <laughs> so, there's that. Um, uh, but it does bring up the question, what type of uh, uh, currency? Uh, uh, James Corbett uh, has an episode on that, which is very good. Uh, the only thing I'd add to his episode is uh, uh, food-based. It seems to me that we could make a food-based cur uh, currency. Now, uh, this is not a durable uh, good. You would, it's basically fiat and anyone could issue currency, right? So like I issue a currency, like, and I think a meal is a very good currency for this because it's very relatable, right? So we could imagine the system could be digitized by the way, uh, where you issue currency and it's backed by your own work, which makes it de facto self-regulated, especially if there's a, uh, some way to track how many currency you have issued in practice, uh, which is you know, kind of useful. And uh, it's inflation proof because a meal is a meal. It's not gonna change over time, right? <laughs> it's, um, it's relatable, it, like everyone can print. It's very de democratic as a result of that. 
and I I suspect it could work. Like uh, if if there's someone in the audience who wants to work on like crypto, uh, uh, some kind of crypto thing uh, that is meal backed, I would love to hear from them. So uh, I'd be curious to to try working on that as well. Um, or a, a simple alternative is, of course, a gift based economy. Just uh, give and take when take later. But like give 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 give. Uh, the, like the indigenous peoples do. Uh, we, as a modern culture, are used to uh, we take and then we pay. But what the way the indigenous work is they give and then later they take uh, gift based. Uh, it's a very dynamic type of uh, uh, economy where you basically don't count, uh, uh, you just give. It's, uh, it depends on trust, obviously. Uh, we also need to take back control of our, of our culture. Uh, I think. But I don't. I don't know. I don't know how uh, uh, how we do this one. To be honest, uh, all I'd say is that our uh, modern. I mean, you know, we do that at the household level, obviously. But I mean, like, the modern talk culture, I think we can all agree is, is toxic. Uh, we we groom fear into our kids uh, from the earliest age, uh, which is horrible. Like I, I'm a new parent uh, still. I mean, my my daughter is five years old now. Uh, I am appalled by children books uh, in general. Uh, we 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 found some good ones, thankfully, but I I was appalled. Like it's you know wolf story, uh, ghost stories, uh, like the song. It's just like oh. uh, it, it's just horrifying. And like seriously, my parents so like my parents sang that to me as I was young. Like what on earth were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> so we we try as parents to you know like not not read fear in, in, into a daughter for that reason, and uh, so so far so good. But you know like uh, school instills fear and fear of authority mm -hmm. and respect of authority. You're like always be fearful if the authority is not there to lead. It's crazy. It's completely bonkers. It's like. Yeah, school is not a place for children. <laughs> it's, it's, okay, opinion. okay. So I think we're uh, reaching the uh, wrap up time here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you have uh, uh, major points you'd like to make here before we uh, wrap up? I'd like to uh, point readers to the last chapter of my book, uh, which uh, discusses natural patterns. It seems to me that there is a fundamental authoritarian premise behind science itself, which permeates our mind. Uh, which is that nature is rational, and I do not, I do not believe that it is. I, I believe that nature works like a language, and we'll talk about this later if we have time. Uh, if not, then uh, I would highly recommend the last chapter of my book uh, for those who are interested. We, we live at the interface, like our mind is an interface with, with the world, really. And so language is what controls that, if you will. Uh, anyway, so... Uh, I, I think that we have a lot to learn about indigenous cultures. Uh, so their main one is to uh, give first, take after. Uh, another two is to take risks and uh, let go. Uh, a bit like the you know, Greek Stoic thing, like what depends on you depends on you, what does not depend on you does not depend on you, and just like deal with it. Uh, which was completely, by the way, and like, which which says to me that they they were already operating like the, uh, the the storytellers, as I like to call them, were already operating at the time because the Christian Stoics rephrased that as uh, it was God's will, if you will, which it is not. It's just you know nature doing its thing. The wolf needed to eat a sheep, so he ate a sheep. Big deal. Like we lost a sheep. There was a wolf. Yeah. Okay. Shit happens. Like protect your sheep, obviously, but you know if one if one goes away, it goes away. It's a, and that, that's a key. That's a key uh, teaching of like I, I can see it with the locals here. Uh, like the chickens again have no coop, none, zero. The chickens are there, <laughs> and like an animal needs to come, like a jaguar. Jaguars eat chicken. <laughs> they don't come close to humans, but uh, like. Hypothetically, if a chicken goes too deep in the jungle, then it gets eaten. It happens. Or sometimes a dog catches one. <laughs> um, and so uh, yeah. uh, I think the key message I have is uh, 
uh, philosophical, if you will, uh, is that what I found most fascinating as I was learning how uh, to grow food was how much discovering uh, how much societies look like their food systems. That it it came as a shocker to me because I I I had such a, like I I had studied social science bit. I had never come across that message. Like if, if I had been told in my early 20s that like a city is a KFO, like concentrated animal feeding operation, I'd have gone, yep, that is actually right. And that is actually right. That is what our cities are. They are concentrated food, uh, animal feeding operations uh, and, and exploitative food uh, operations at that. And uh, the dystopia where we're heading is like, you know, like the, um, uh, Chinese pig factories, multi-stories with pigs, uh, AI driven, or they, they're tagged all the way across, rationed and what have you. That's our future if we don't react, so let's do something about it. Anyway, uh, ways to help out, uh, uh, just to wrap up, uh, please uh, circulate this message. I, Especially among expert media voices, uh, I'd be especially keen if someone can circulate it among fossil fuel interest, because I would love to be participating in uh, trying to smash the propaganda in court uh, with them. Uh, but also local groups that can actually take action. So councils, farmers, loggers, gardening clubs, and things like that. Um, uh, it seems to me that we need to get the word out. Let's empower the activists. Like, let's turn the, uh, let's turn the like, completely demoralized masses against their manipulators. I think that will work. I really do think it will work. And, um, uh, if there are scientists in the audience who want to write peer review article based on uh, what I've been discussing in this uh, chat, uh, by all means, get in touch. I do not think that it will change a thing, but like, let's get those papers out uh, because my work has not been peer reviewed. I don't care about peer review, uh, especially. Um, but like some people, they only read peer review papers, so let's put them something in front of them. Um, I'd be especially interested in a um, uh, in a study that measures the difference in carbon dioxide between an alley cropping system and a open field system. Because that paper, to my mind, and we could do that one in the spring when farmers are tilling, because there are alley cropping systems that exist already. And so we could just like, you know, take the measurement and uh, by next spring, we could have the question settled and the paper out by summer probably. Uh, and peer reviewed, and that would be a, uh, I think, a bombshell uh, paper. Uh, I, maybe there are papers that ex actually exist on that topic already. For all I know, like, but let, let's let's highlight them. Mm -hmm. if that's the case. I, I haven't even looked into the literature. Uh, and uh, uh, most importantly of all, like, uh, please deliver this message yourself. Like, I'm just the messenger, but like, this message is what is what matters. Like. I can deliver this message. Anyone who can read can deliver this message. Just like, you know, it's it's accounting fraud. It's not rocket science, it's accounting fraud. We just need to highlight this is accounting fraud and and keep repeating it until people get uh, hold on, yeah. This is accounting fraud. And in court, they cannot escape by saying, Oh, you're not an expert, but like in court, you show the accounting for fraud for what it is, and there's no escaping that they can do. Because it is an accounting fraud at the end. So we just need to highlight the fraud. And I, I mean, I'm happy to deliver this message myself, but uh, I think other people can deliver this message too. Uh, so I highly encourage anyone who can do so to actually do so. Um, uh, for my own efforts, uh, look, uh, if anyone is interested in uh, joining the regenerative, regenerative uh, movement and interested in some kind of workshop, uh, happy to do one. Uh, I, I, there are lots of workshops already uh, by permaculture experts, regen ag experts. Lots of resources on ag and, and permaculture, mm -hmm. but soil science, tons of stuff. Uh, it can be a bit overwhelming, uh, so I, it seems to me that there might be a need for some like hands-on uh, uh, crash course, if you will, that one two hours. Uh, if you have any interest in this, uh, please uh, uh, subscribe to my Substack and write me. Uh, my email is on my website. It's easy to find. It's uh, -D -E -B -E -R -N -A -R -D -Y at protonmail.com. So uh, like, 
email your thoughts and uh, what you would like to see in a workshop. It seems to me that the most practical uh, thing to uh, be teaching to newcomers in the field would be uh, like how to grow potatoes in the garden, uh, how to uh, make your own fertilizer, uh, how to um, uh, have healthy plants in general, uh, how to select plants so that they work together, uh, that type of thing. So if there's interest in that, uh, I can keep it short in one hour, two hour uh, sessions that uh, can make it uh, very practical and functional. Uh, happy to do that. Uh, we'd love to work in that actually uh, and, and turn that into uh, my, my full-time job. Um, uh, for the rest, uh, I, I could use some financial support at the moment. Uh, so if there are some uh, uh, lovely backers, uh, please get in touch. Uh, also remote work opportunities, uh, especially interested in court cases, as I said, uh, also interested in regenerative work, like counsel that needs help, farmer that needs help, loggers that needs a uh, uh, piece of advice, uh, or like landowner who wants to start a big garden or something, you can do that too, like uh, hands-on. Uh, for the rest, management consulting, I can do that too. So uh, <laughs> for those who are potentially interested, uh, I used to uh, run a marketing and sales team uh, was my last job. So I, okay. I, I can give good advice on those things as well. And I think that's it. Okay, uh, very good. You uh, brought up a lot of uh, things, I, a lot of facts I have not heard before. So thank you for doing that. And I'll uh, get this published pretty soon. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're most welcome. Uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks for helping me uh, get this message out. It's it's really like, uh, it's, I, 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 you know, I, I released my book like a couple of months ago uh, and it was a soft release out of necessity because we were fleeing the Ukraine war at the time. So uh, we we moved from, uh, we didn't call it in Hungary. So we moved to Mexico. And uh, and so it was really a soft launch and this is the de facto uh, 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 launch of, of, my, of my book for all practical intents really. So uh, the book is short by the way, for those who want to read it, uh, 30,000 words or so. Really, really short. Uh, it's on my Substack. Uh, anyone can read it. Uh, I didn't want to make it a paid for book because I think the information in it is, it, it matters more that the information is out and people buy the book. For those who want to buy it, like, please. But uh, the other, it needs to get out. So we need to stop this down, shall we? Okay. Uh, I hope we will. I, in fact, I'm, I know we will. I'm, in, deep inside me, I'm sure we have already won. And, and I think they know it. I uh, honestly, I, they are they are just laughing at us at the moment. The, 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 like they, they're just trolling us <laughs> with, with their media but, story. Like, the, the, the the lunacy of the of the, the media story that we are fed yeah. day in day out. It, it, it's just trolling at this point. Like who the hell still believes anything they say? Seriously. But, but you think they know they have lost? Yes, I think so. Uh, good. All right. So on that I, note. I, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that loads, uh, let's uh, go ahead and wrap up. But thank you very much. And we'll talk to you next time. Okay. Ciao, ciao.